Thank you guys. It's beautiful. So good to sing with you all. And we're going to begin with a question is, can you do it? Can you sit through church when there's bacon and pancakes on the way? And we're entering into the Lenten season, so, you know, we're going to see if you can live not just by bread alone, but on the Word of God. So we'll see if you can, uh, we can hold your attention this morning. And so uh, with that, we'll, we'll pray and, you know, God will God will do the work. So let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for this time we have, this time in your word. Father, this time to sing, this time to greet one another, Lord. And just pray that uh, you'd continue to help us to grow deeper into community, Lord. Help us to be a welcoming family that cares and loves, uh, that uh, is about you and the things that matter most in this world. And so just help us to... uh, to look deep into your wonderful face, Lord, that is shining, and to understand that we're built to enjoy you, God, and to bring glory to you. So I pray that uh, you teach us, be our good rabbi this morning. In your name we pray, amen. So we're starting a new series, as I just said, and uh, this is for our time leading to Easter, known as Lent. And Lent is a time of reflection. Lent is a time where uh, we begin to look at who we are in light of who God is, right? Who we are in light of the great I am. And begin to look at those places in our life, maybe that we don't want to look, that feel uncomfortable, and yet God is calling us deeper into uh, a life with him. And so in order to do that, in order to make space for that, we need to uh, look into the darkness, face those, uh, those things in our life that we don't want to face, and to uncover those rocks that we keep in the corner for a reason. And so um, I'm going to read some scripture for us this morning, and we're going to see how Jesus is a great guide for all of us who are tempted, who are struggling with sin, and who are in need of an authority that can and does and has broken the chains of sin and death. Um, And so, will you turn with me? We're going to be in John chapter 8 this morning, starting at verse 12. And if you just so happen to be with us on New Year's this year, um, I got to preach the context. I preached the chapter before this, and it's within the same context of the Festival of the Tabernacles. And in that sermon, I talked about how this was a seven-day event, and Jesus waited to the end for the climax Uh, of this ceremony in order to step into this uh, conversation about authority and to declare that he was the authoritative teacher in the Jewish temple and that uh, the Pharisees who had been teaching for those last seven days were in fact teaching in a way that was dry, that had no life in it that was not the way God wanted to go. And so we're going to continue in this conversation starting at verse 12, and you'll see that there is a debate happening. There's a point, counterpoint happening in uh, this part of the text. So uh, let's see how Jesus represents himself in the midst of a difficult time in his life. It says this, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the Pharisees challenged him, here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And Jesus answered, 
Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is my Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. And the part we're going to focus on in this, this story today uh, in this dialogue, in this representation of Jesus' identity, he's making an identity statement, is that Jesus says, you don't know where I came from, and you don't know where I'm headed. And I think those two things, if we know where we came from and where we're headed, help us to resi- resist temptation. Do you know the stock? Do you know what you're made of? Do you know who you come from? Do you know the legacy that you walk in? The great people that came before you? Do you have a great goal? A great ambition? A north star that's pointing you in the direction that you want to go? A great pursuit in the kingdom of God that gets you up in the morning and gets you on your way. If you have those things put together, you will have such a great ability to resist the temptations that will come your way. And Jesus' temptation here is the temptation, if he would just not claim authority, everything would be fine for him. He could function within Jewish society, but because he was sent to speak the truth of who he is as a Savior and Messiah of the world and the authoritative teacher, he is headed to the cross. And these are the guys that are going to put him there. And he knows what he's saying has that kind of lethal implication for him. It would have been so much easier for him to just let these guys have their religious festival. But he knows where he came from and he knows where he is headed. And so he has to proclaim, I am the light of the world. And let's look at scripture's underground tunnels that work towards this statement. And we're going to go from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end of the Bible. So these are the two places easiest to find in your Bible because it's the first page and the last page, essentially. Okay, so go to Genesis chapter 1, and we'll take up a conversation about light. Genesis 1, verse 3. And God said, that's important, God said, let there be light. So God creates through his word. Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Okay, so... We see here, this is the first picture of light. Before that was the tovu vavohu, which was the, the waste, the wild and the waste of the darkness before the creation of the world. And then God spoke and his light came into being. Okay? But if you, if you jump down with me, let's look at this. It's so interesting. Verse 
14, and God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. Okay, we just saw that God separated day from night with the light, but then we also say here that there was vaults, the, the sun and the moon, and those things created day and night. So why are we picking up uh, in a different paragraph a conversation that God already did that? And scholars say that what's happening here is that there's a Trinitarian work in our midst, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are working together in endless selfless giving and love. And out of that selfless giving and love and community together, that God spoke a word out. And that word we find out in John, the beginning of John is Jesus. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But Jesus was also there in the beginning, right? And he was there as the light of the world. So this light that's described in Genesis is Jesus' light that is there at the beginning. That's what Jesus comes from. That is his stock. There before anything else to break the darkness into day and night and be in very creation itself as the light. Okay, so that's where Jesus came from. And then turn with me to Revelations. This is chapter 22, verse 5. It says this. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So John's picture of a new heaven and a new earth when Jesus comes again is that there will be no more night that there will only be light. That Jesus' claim here that I am the light of the world will reach its fullness. And so heaven will be this radiant, beautiful place. And it says there will be no need for lamps anymore. Which is kind of a curious thing unless you remember Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount when he's teaching about salt and light. And he's saying that uh, he's calling us to be lamps. He's saying, don't hide your lamp. Be a light. Be a city of light, you Christians who are made of salt and light. And represent the light in the darkness. Because between Genesis and Revelation is a lot of conversation about who we are to be in the midst of the darkness. We come from the light, and we're headed towards the light. And Jesus says in that Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't say, it's so interesting, right? He claims here in John, I am the light of the world. But in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the light of the world, a city on the hill, a lamp. Don't hide your light. That's what we were saying this a lot of my, yeah. Don't hide it. And so, do you know where you came from? And do you know where you are headed? Because if you know those things, this relationship to temptation and the darkness will be one that you can ultimately withstand. Life isn't just one game we play where we win or lose, but a series of games over time. And each one a skirmish, some of them which we lose. But if we know who we are, we're willing to get up again and again, fail again, try again, fail better, 
because we know we're made for more than where we are right now. We know we're headed somewhere in this sanctification process. And it's interesting because Amos, the prophet, takes up this conversation too, and he, he talks about how he, he gets real prophetic, and he's saying, hey, you religious people in his time, he says, you know what? You think God's bringing light, but he's actually going to bring a day of darkness. And that's right in the context of let righteousness flow like a never-ending stream. Because Amos is saying, hey, you people that think you're of the light, you haven't seen darkness in a long time. You've been in and amidst light and happy, and we pray attend like everything's okay with no acknowledgement that we're still living in the in-between time where there is a whole lot of darkness. And so you want to worship and celebrate with, you know, all your instruments and make big festivals and be such righteous religious people, but you have not acknowledged the poor. You have not done justice to the people within your midst. And in that case, then, you must experience the darkness in order to understand who you're called to be in the light. But if you know where you came from, you know where you're headed. And a lot of what Lent is typically about is giving stuff up and then white-knuckling it, and then Easter comes if you made it, you give yourself a pat on the back, and then you just go back to whatever you were doing. But I think that the reality of Jesus' mission on earth is that when you're compelled to follow him, that things just fall by the wayside because you realize there's so much more meaningful ways to live your life and things to do and things to be in the world that you don't have time for those other things. You don't have time for those other habits in your life. So it's more about taking up a mission than it is just, you know, with your own might, just giving something up for a little while. So maybe you give up, you know, eating carbs so that you can pray or something like that. That there's both and situation happening here. That you're sacrificing time so that you can have time with the Lord. Okay, and um, I think this is so profound because one of the things the light does is it reveals things. It exposes all of those uncomfortable places within us that we never want to have exposed. And when we get alone with God, we get truthful with God, we all know those places that we want to leave unchecked. But if we have the courage and identity to face them instead of just put our head in the sand, they may actually become the very places that we need to go. The dark places. And we see uh, a, a couple practical examples to just bring this home. The first is, who are you in the darkness? So on... Wednesday of last week, I was at Bibles and Brews, and I was having a conversation. We got one question in, and the question was, what were your formative experiences with God? And one of the reasons we got that far was because the first person to talk told us one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard, and he was talking about how he was a commander in Vietnam, and that he was kind of a nominal Catholic, and he... I didn't really go to church that often, but kind of, you know, was okay with God and things like that. But then he got assigned to do security for this place in Penang that had already been attacked. And so the Viet Cong had coordinates for this place already, right? And so he was assigned to be the security for this place, and the enemy already knew where they were. So you can imagine how terrifying that was as they would drive around and they just 
you know, get bombed. And so he said that one of the things that kept him going was this little Baptist church that was connected to somebody in his group. And they would just send the preacher sermons, and they then knew everybody's name in his platoon. And they would say an encouraging word to them, and they'd send it out. And they, in their time where they had rest, they would go, everybody would go. He said, didn't matter, Christian, atheist, wherever you were, whoever you were, you just went and you sat and you listened and then you heard your name and that somebody cared about you and he said every guy was crying. Because it was like a little bit of light in a very dark situation. And he talked about a Jesuit priest who was there who had literally chased guys down before they went out to fight just to offer them communion, just to give them a little bit of peace and a promise of protection in the midst of a dark place. Now, if that priest would have said, well, that place is too dark, I don't want to go there, then his light would have never shined so brightly, changing Dennis's life forever. And, okay, so let's make it even more practical. So, uh, here in Redondo Beach, about three weeks ago, two gals under the age of 30 came to our homeless sack lunch program. And there's a social worker that's now taken, uh, uh, taken up a, a space within our church in order to help people that are homeless. And she's sort of known for being the best social worker, which we're all just like, yes, come help us out. Okay, and she goes to underneath the pier in Redondo Beach. And underneath the pier in Redondo Beach, if you talk to police officers, uh, that's a place where heavy drug activity is happening. And from what I know, because I know these gals, heavy abuse is taking place underneath the pier, okay? And this social worker goes to the dark place under the pier. And she she brought these two gals to St. Andrew's sack lunch program. And one of them was like four months pregnant. And she does that because she knows there's a group of people at St. Andrew's that they'll, they'll have a meal. And uh, then there's people there that are now in, in clothing and all the safety of being in a good place and the safe harbor of that. And then there's people there also that will pray with them and then work on finding shelter for them, permanent supportive housing. And there's like a team of 10 people now from the city and all various uh, like Harbor Interfaith and Path and all these places that are all now committed to our people. And so when these two gals walk in, they both came because St. Andrews was a light to them, a city on a hill to them. And the social worker knew that this would be a good place. And so all in one day, uh, the, remember the Pregnancy Help Center? They came and spoke. It was the, the week after that, we sent this young gal named Faith to go see them. And it was like, well, we heard the announcement. Now we need them, for reals. And so uh, we took her there. They uh, then uh, Miriam took her to a bunch of other resources. And uh, at the end of all of that, unfortunately, she had so many issues, the social worker had to take her back to the darkness. And I don't know about you, but when I hear stories like that, it just kills me. It breaks my heart. It rips my heart open. And it makes me go, I never want to try and help. Because look what it leaves us all with. But I said there was two gals, right? And so we were all focused on the one who actually, in the next few weeks after that, was able to get some resources and help. But that day was not happening. But this other girl, Karen, she on that day woke up underneath a pier. She has schizophrenia. But if you looked at her, she would look like any normal person you would see on the street. And she 
was brought to St. Andrews, then she was taken to Long Beach Rescue Mission, then at Long Beach Rescue Mission, they set up a court date for her, they got her the right medication that she needs, and she is in a sober living home now, and she woke up on the streets, and she's headed towards permanent supportive housing. Okay, and that was two gals that came to us. This is the relationship of the light and the darkness. St. Andrews, uh, you know, there's 90,000 people in California that are homeless. Statistics like that can really defeat us and seem so overwhelming. But what I've seen is that the people who have decided that they just want to be a light, however flickering in the darkness, become a solution. And the more lights that shine, the more the tide turns on one of the most horrible issues in our time. You know, missions work isn't just overseas. It is right here on our doorstep. And I'm not just going to send you out. I'm not going to send you out to just go by yourself. That would be a mistake. Do not do that. But I am going to invite you into learning day after day to confront your own darkness, to not be overwhelmed by the darkness of the world, and to, as you grow in your ability to shine, then you will be the type of guide that people who are in the darkest of places can rely upon and can use whatever part of life you're in, whatever mission you're called to, whatever piece of the light is your piece of the light. You don't all have to do the homeless ministry. That's not the point. But we do need to know where we came from, and we need to know where we're going. And in the midst of that, we can resist the temptations that come our way. So let that be our prayer this morning, that we would know the light of the world, and that as we look full in his wonderful face, that we might receive, like we saw in the video, we might receive his light and shine as well. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you continue to draw us into your light. And God, as we spend time in your word, as we pray, Lord, as we think about those places that need healing, Lord, we think about that sin that... Uh, needs to be confronted again by your love, by your goodness, by your holiness. Lord, that uh, you would strengthen us, you'd embolden us, you'd help us to go deeper and wider in relationship with you. In your name we pray. Amen.